Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains and to the Algorithms course at the University of Cambridge. Now that we have a reasonable understanding of asymptotic complexity, let's put it to good use. And we have a couple of videos on that topic if you need a refresher. First, in this video, we are going to have a look at the worst case time complexity of insert sort. After that, we are going to establish some bounds on the cost of sorting that are valid for every possible uh, comparison-based sorting algorithm, including ones that have not been invented yet. I've seen the insert sort again last time, and I and I consider what is the rate of growth of the time cost of insert sort. We said already uh, there was a nesting of two loops in that algorithm. So the outer loop was when I was going through the cards that I received from the dealer. Uh, or uncovering the elements of the array I have not seen yet. And I have to go through that outer loop for every element in the array. And then the new element I just see may have to go down uh, towards the uh, left end if it needs to, but it may, it may not necessarily have to do that. If it's a big one, it may stop early or not move at all. If it's a small one, it may have to move all the way. So. Because my complexity analysis is always based on the worst case, then I have to check what is the worst case for my algorithm. The worst case is that every time I look at the larger portion of the array, I get something that needs to go all the way there. So again, 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 always I find something smaller than anything else, and it needs to move there. So in that worst case, how many uh, times do I run the inner loop? Uh, a number of times is basically 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, so that's a, a triangular number. And you know that uh, when Carl Friedrich Gauss was in elementary school, uh, the teacher wanted to have some time off and read the newspaper or something. And so he said, uh, all right, guys, so today what you're going to do, they, they, had a, this little, they didn't have iPads, they had a little blackboard slate with a, uh, with a chalk. Uh, please uh, add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. And so the children started writing numbers from 1 to 100. And he had barely finished uh, stating a problem, sitting in his comfortable chair, taking the newspaper out, uh, when uh, little Carl Friedrich comes to his uh, desk and shows the slate with the number, because instead of adding them all up, he had just figured that if you have this uh, one, and then two, and then three, and then four, like this, it makes a triangle like this. It makes a triangle of n equals 100. And if I stick another triangle here, then I get a rectangle that is here is n plus 1. Uh, and so n times n plus 1 divided by 2 is uh, the sum that the teacher wanted. And so he didn't get to read his newspaper. He had to praise Carl Friedrich for being much cleverer than him. Anyway, so uh, n times n plus 1 divided by 2, uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, all we care about is this part. So is uh, theta of n squared. So that is the cost of our insert sort in asymptotic terms. And then I say, OK, that's one way of sorting. Uh, is this uh, the best that can be done? Probably no. Uh, and before I look at better ways of doing it, can I establish some uh, boundaries on how uh, sorting is going to cost? So if I... Um, If I consider the best possible algorithm, I don't know what the best possible algorithm is, but there must be, there must be some best possible algorithm for sorting n elements uh, with comparisons between pairs of elements. Um, 
I'm always doing worst case analysis, so I'm considering the worst possible case for this best algorithm. So don't mix up these um, alternations of worst uh, and best. The operations that I do is comparing elements and swapping elements for putting things in the right place. So um, I'm going to say swaps and comparison. And um, my best possible algorithm, even on its worst possible input, will do at least and at most at least this many swaps at most this many swaps at least this many comparisons at most this many comparisons so this is uh, best possible algorithm on its worst input. Worst, I mean at least favorable input. All right. So, um, I already did insert sort, which may not be the best, but uh, it exists, it works. I did a kind of uh, almost proof that it worked last time. Uh, and it did at most uh, a big O of n squared operations. So I can say um, at most big O of n squared. If I have built an algorithm that does something, then surely the best possible algorithm does at most what my algorithm did. Because my algorithm may not be the best. But surely the best cannot do any worse, otherwise it wouldn't be the best. Uh, but this bound may not be the ultimate bound. I may find a better bound if I uh, study a little more. But at the moment, I have a bound here. I have nothing here, so I'm happy I have something here. Now, at least how many uh, swaps do I have to do, at least? Well, um, consider that I'm talking about the worst possible input for my algorithm. So uh, the worst possible input would be where everything is in the wrong place. So if everything is in the wrong place, then when I do a swap, I change the position of two things. If I have n items, all of them in the wrong place, by doing a swap, I affect two of these items. So if the best algorithm is so great that every time it does a swap, it puts two items in their final correct place, absurdly good algorithm, then surely even that would need to do at least n half swaps in order to touch all the things that are in the wrong place and put them in the right place. So uh, at least it will have to do n half swaps. So notice I'm putting a bound here. I'm not saying that I know how to do it like this. I'm saying whatever the algorithm is, I mean, you can be Gauss, you can be Newton, you can be God. You are not going to be able to do it in any less than that. I don't know if you can do it, but whatever you do, it's not going to be any better, any uh, smaller number than this. As far as comparisons go, well, I am limiting myself to sorting algorithms that uh, look at the input in terms of taking two items, checking them relative to each other, and then doing something or doing something else. There's going to be an if statement within the code that says, if this is less than that, do this. Otherwise, do that. 
There may be other types of sorting algorithms that do something else with their input and know more about their input, and we uh, will see that in a couple of lectures. But for the moment, we're only considering comparison sorts. So this table is relative to sorts that work in this way. For these sorts, an unsorted array uh, that I receive as my input with n items will have to go through the various mechanics. And based on these comparisons, uh, I may swap this, swap that, not swap this, and eventually come to a sorted position. So the sorted position is basically um, a permutation of my input. So all the elements that were in here go somewhere else. Uh, and this permutation produces from my original input produces the sorted output. Now, for every possible input that I receive, I must produce a different permutations to reach the sorted output. Uh, or because permutations are bijective, I can, I, I can always reverse them. I can uh, say things in reverse. If I take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, n, then my algorithm must be able to branch out to all possible permutations of these n numbers. Uh, reaching all of them uh, in order to be able to sort anything. So this decision tree where I do a comparison, I have any statement and I branch two ways depending on the result of the comparison. How many leaves does it need to have? In order to be able to sort all n items, it needs to have as many leaves as there are permutations of n items, right? So uh, how many permutations there are of n items? That's an easy uh, combinatory thing. There's n factorial permutations. So uh, how tall is a binary tree with n leaves? If the binary tree is perfectly balanced, uh, then at every level, the number of leaves grows by a factor of 2. And so uh, for a height of h, I will have 2 to the h leaves. And so uh, imagining the tree is perfectly balanced, because if it's not perfectly balanced, I will have to pay even more. Uh, I will have to have an even higher height, I mean. Then uh, the uh, number of leaves being this would have to be equal to 2 to the h height of the tree. And so the h has to be the logarithm uh, of n factorial. So h I'll use LG as the notation, say logarithm base 2, because I'll use logarithms base 2 more than any other type of logarithm, n factorial. Uh, and because n factorial, there's an approximation to n factorial that says it's uh, more or less n to the n, then uh, I take the logarithm, and this n goes over here, uh, which gives me n log n as, uh, as the height uh, of this tree, the height of the tree being the number of uh, steps I need to do to traverse and go to a leaf. Now, uh, I want to, if the tree is unbalanced, the height may be uh, slightly longer on some paths. Anyway, so this would say that at least I have to spend n log n although by this argument I haven't given you a method for doing it. I've just said whatever you do, uh, no algorithm can do better than this. Now if I uh, think a little more, I can uh, find ways of improving on these bounds. So, so long as there's a gap between this at most and this at least bound, then there's space here for me to uh, play around in. Uh, and if I am smart, I manage to bring this down, this one up, this one up, this one down. Uh, and when I finally manage to have the same growth rate at, in both, then I know that this is optimal. And no matter how hard I think, I will not be able to do any better in asymptotic terms uh, if I have both an at most and an at least bound that 
have the same growth rate. So um, I can be putting a theta in here. If I think of the situation where is someone going to self-destruct? Um, if I have a situation where all my elements in the array are in the wrong place, how many swaps do I need to put them in the right place? Well, I said, if, if every swap fixes two places and half. Well, I don't know how to actually do it, but I know in practice one swap, if I have my array here, there's going to be the minimum that should be here. It may be anywhere. Wherever it is, I can swap it with whatever is in this place, and I will put the minimum in the correct position. After that, the next position here, the minimum of the rest will be somewhere, and I can swap it and put it here. Uh, and for here, the minimum of these ones, I can put it here. So one swap will put at least one thing in the right place. And by doing that repeatedly for every position, I will have sorted my array. So this is a method that works, as opposed to this one, which is just a conceptual construction. I mean, if you could, if you could. Well, this one, you can, uh, with just n swaps, sort your array. So I can say I have a big improvement here. Forget about this in exactly n. And notice that this is not big O or any of that other uh, hand wavy stuff. It's actually n, as in the number n. Um, in exactly n operations, uh, I can sort this. Uh, and for comparisons, uh, you can also, um, I mean, you've already seen in the in last term that there are ways of doing uh, comparison sort in, in uh, n log n comparisons, which reaches the same as this. And so in both cases, we have a growth rate of big O of n over here and here, big O of n log n here. And so we have established the optimum boundaries for uh, complexity of uh, comparison sort. 